So uh, we are here to discuss identity as a service in higher education. Is the cloud ready? So about us, my name is Scott Wyant. This is Jim Van Lendehem. Uh, Jim and I both work with Moran Technology Consulting. And at Moran Technology, we provide IT management and technology consulting uh, predominantly to higher education institutions. So we have worked with approximately 300 colleges and universities over the last 13 or 14 years. Um, and like Deidre, uh, we both have our backgrounds actually in higher education, obviously as students and graduate students, but as adjunct faculty and faculty uh, working in library services, IT operations. So uh, before we were consultants, uh, we uh, worked in IT and higher education. Uh, I run the IT security practice for Moran one of our focuses is on identity and access management. Uh, in particular, uh, we provide strategic planning, roadmaps, and vendor selection for identity and access management uh, solutions. And this presentation has really grown out of not only the 10 years of experience, uh, plus of uh, helping institutions select vendors and uh, design and implement solutions, uh, but more recently, uh, we're going to take a look at three specific use cases of clients that we've worked with over the last about 12 months um, that will uh, highlight uh, our findings. So before we get started, uh, I want to focus here on the second definition. Uh, identity as a service has uh, or is commonly used uh, in the literature, in the vendor analysis, um, to describe a specific set of identity services. Uh, commonly, it's focused on single sign-on, federation, access management services. Uh, the way that we're going to use the term, we're going to speak to identity as a service more broadly. And so there are vendors that are providing uh, traditional uh, identity governance, provisioning, deprovisioning, uh, group management, and so forth in the cloud, cloud architected solutions. And so uh, when we speak to identity as a service, we're going to speak to that broader set of services and solutions. OK, our approach. What are we going to discuss? So to begin with, uh, we're going to use uh, the Internet 2 tier identity reference architecture, or service architecture, which is a fairly common architecture referenced in the higher education space to describe and outline the core identity and access management services. And we're going to use that reference architecture as a way to align current vendors, identity and access management vendors, uh, particularly cloud architected solutions, to that reference architecture. Once we've done that, we're going to take a look uh, or present our taxonomy for higher education institutions or types of higher education institutions. So we are going to use things like complexity, of needs, budget, and so forth to uh, develop three categories or types of higher education based upon their needs. Um, we'll then use the use cases that I mentioned um, to walk through what actual institutions in the last year have done with regards to developing an architecture and selecting cloud architected identity solutions uh, based upon that taxonomy. Jim, you're up. management. This is the tier reference architecture. We didn't make this, but this is from Internet 2. Okay. So one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to break down what kind of functionality these vendors have and how that relates to higher education using the de facto higher education tier reference model. But to do that, um, I mean, it talks about functionality in here, and this is really good for an architecture, but what we really need to do is talk about functionality of vendors so that we can understand what that means. So we kind of overlaid this with a, a few boxes that kind of talk about, okay, this is the quadrant of this architecture, this is entity registration, okay? So what does entity registration in terms of functionality that vendors offer? So we broke it down to basically what entity registry includes is matching and UID, master person store, most of you know that as the sole source of truth, 
and identity lifecycle, having the information to know when to make decisions. Now, you look down in the middle, we also added uh, notifications to this, this little blue bar in the middle. That right there is kind of, it kind of interconnects to all the different quadrants, so it's, it's right there in the middle. But uh, Tier left out notifications at that point, so we added it there because that's where we thought it would belong. So we also changed the name of the roles and group service. It used to be just called group services. Uh, we thought there was a little bit of confusion about, okay, what's a role versus what's a group and what does it do? So we added them in there uh, because specifically roles are really to classify a specific type of user based on access needs. And then groups are to apply those needs to a specific resource. And so included in this for vendor functionality, we considered entitlement management, role management, and certification adaptation. Um, many of you probably are familiar with FERPA if you're in a higher education meeting. So people sometimes have a FERPA opt-out policy. Sometimes they include, um, you know, like a, a little checkbox when you reset your password. So those are the kinds of things that we consider in the roles and group services quadrant. And those are directly mapped to specific functionality vendors offer. So next we have provisioning services. There was a lot of stuff in there, but basically this breaks down in terms of functionality as provisioning and deprovisioning, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. Self-service, which is allowing the user to participate more freely in their access management, manage their passwords, you know, do workflows, approvals, things like that. And so uh, the authentication and federation services portion of this slide in this quadrant here includes single sign-on, social login, federation, MFA. Tier didn't really include social login or MFA because when they made this, it probably wasn't a thing yet. But uh, you know, we've added that because we're trying to map these IDAS vendors to uh, specific functionality in how higher education architecture works. So now that we understand you know, where each type of functionality lives, we can talk about where specific vendors live in that space, right? So we've talked about, we did a lot of research, uh, these kind of uh, vendors, Centrify, Microsoft Azure, Okta, One Login, Oracle, Ping Identity, they're all really good at access management. They're all cloud architected access management solutions. And they do primarily that. Uh, they also do a little bit in the lower right quadrant, which is group provisioning, deprovisioning. And some of them dabble a little bit in the role in uh, group registration. So they kind of live there, but they don't really do much with actually matching data up from separate data sources. They don't really do a lot with uh, UID, you know, assigning a specific UID. They don't really do a lot with uh, having a specific mass or person store. They kind of rely on that being there for their product to work. So then we categorize some different vendors, which are cloud architected IDA solutions. Um, there aren't a whole lot of really inclusive cloud architected IDA solutions out there. Based on the research, we decided to include Fisher International, SailPoint Identity Now, and Savvy Security Manager. So these are all solutions that play kind of in the, the left bottom and right bottom quadrants and the top quadrant. They do more with data management and they do um, you know, a lot of stuff. They're very good at entitlement management, role management, and they're also very good at group management and uh, provisioning and deprovisioning. So now that we understand you know, where the vendors stand, how we classified those vendors based on the tier architecture, we can start talking about how most higher education institutions fall into the following three categories. Now, for these, to come up with these three categories, we use criteria such as budget, um, complexity, and uh, IT organization. So is it central or is it decentral? And then we also use size. So basic small private community colleges, they're often concerned with just getting their users access or accounts in time. Um, a lot of them are doing manual processes and they just want them automate so that they can improve their user experience. Uh, they often have a low budget and uh, they're not really super complex because they're very traditional. They just have regular students, undergraduate students often. Uh, some have graduate programs, but faculty and staff there's not really a whole lot of other things going on there. And then the moderate category represents mid to large sized colleges and universities. So they have a bit of a budget, but uh, you know, they also have a little bit of complexity because they have more mature processes, they have more specific needs. And uh, so their distributed IT is usually somewhat central. They usually have like a central IT org, but it's not all controlled there. There's other pockets that exist elsewhere. 
And then we talk about the advanced category, which often include large research universities. They very often have uh, big research budgets. Uh, they include hospital systems. And often they're very highly decentralized, right? If they have a central IT at all, it's you know very little power. They don't have a lot of political influence. And there's just all these different things, business schools that have their own separate processes, their own separate sources of authority. So basically, these three are how we classify. There's some of them that kind of probably fall in outliers, but most of the institutions that we evaluated fall into this category. So now that we understand how the vendor functionality fits into higher education, and we understand how higher education institutions have different needs, um, I'll move it on to Scott so he can talk about findings. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so the findings are really the use cases. Um, and so this case that we're gonna take a look at is a tier one research university. Um, university has ranked in the top 30 institutions in the country with regards to research budget. It's also a top 30 ranked undergraduate program. Um, and it also has a health system attached to it and central IT is at least partially responsible for identity and access management for that health system as well as uh, the traditional campus and research. Um, the defining needs for uh, this particular uh, client of ours, this institution, um, are really complex data management needs. And this is something that you know, Deidre spoke to earlier. Uh, but the client has multiple sources of uh, record um, applicant records, student records, alumni slash advancement, our donor records, as well as employee, volunteer, and other types of affiliates and research collaboration. Um, they also have very complex business processes, and so this fits into areas of identity governance when it comes to um, being able to implement complex workflow and approval workflow uh, and attestation or certification uh, particularly in the health systems or in federal funded uh, research areas. And then, um, as Jim had just mentioned, uh, like most tier one research universities, it's a highly distributed IT environment. Uh, in this case, we worked with Central IT, who was responsible for the central identity and access management services, um, but there were literally dozens of mature IT departments across the university uh, that were developing and managing their own applications, um, that had their own role systems, as well as often authentication and identity solutions in each one of those uh, or many of the uh, various programs, departments, or schools. Um, and so we don't have time to go into a lot of the detail, but as, uh, we've developed a, a measure across um, those categories that Jim men 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 excuse me, mentioned um, with regards to complexity, IT distribution, budget, and so forth. And of course, this university would score at the top of the uh, advanced needs category. So let's take a look at what they decided to do. So no surprise, like there's not a single IT access management solution on premise or in the cloud that addresses all the needs of this university. Um, however, when it comes to selecting an identity governance solution responsible for provisioning and deprovisioning, um, applying policy for birthright uh, roles and entitlements, um, and managing uh, attestation certification, this university selected to go with a cloud-first approach and selected SailPoint Identity Now, the SailPoint cloud solution. However, based on those needs, um, and this is still in the architecture uh, and early development phases, um, there's an understanding that some hybrid solution might be required with regards to identity governance. So although they're gonna go with a cloud first sale point identity now solution, uh, they understand that as the requirements work out, some of the complex areas of data management for uh, identity matching across multiple sources of records, also um, for things like uh, certification, attestation, approval for health system roles um, might require heavy compute, and that's not cost effective really for the vendor. And so an on-prem 
sale point IIQ may be required for some of those functions, offloading some of the heavy co compute uh, resource intensive uh, identity governance work. So for identity governance, they're gonna do a hybrid cloud on-premise solution, but they're also looking at um, other cloud, traditional IDAS solutions like Okta to address needs for the distributed application environment, simplifying and standardizing the approach to pr providing authentication and more importantly authorization to distributed applications. And then in the third place, um, they're also looking at Cirrus Identity as a social login uh, solution. Um, and so we just had the conversation about uh, types of affiliations to the university. Uh, in, in this case and in the next use case as well, we'll see that while there may be 50 to 80,000 active users, students, employees, various types of guests, you can have hundreds of thousands of barely active users, alumni. Uh, one of the most common things that we see is alumni need to sign on to the student information system to do things like request a transcript. So for the average alumni, this might happen once a year, maybe every five years, and yet they still need to have some access to that application or service. And so this is a case where social login, allowing for limited access to critical services uh, can remove um, that block of three, 400,000 alumni from the main identity uh, <clears throat> the main identity governance provisioning and deprovisioning process. Okay, so use case number two. This is a large public university um, with very limited research. And so they have the size and scale of the first use case, but they have very different needs. Their IT is distributed, but not nearly as mature. Their distributed IT uh, requirements are much lower. Um, and they're still struggling to come up with a manageable automated solution to manage birthright entitlements for provisioning and deprovisioning. And they just don't have the budget for some of the more expensive cloud architected solutions. So this is a mid-range use case. And they took a very different approach. So in this case, the large public university opted to remain with a cost-effective on-premise identity governance solution. In this case, it happened to be Microsoft Identity Manager. It's a tool that can scale to the size of the university and the number of identities that they must provision, but it's very cost-effective. However, they still were looking to the cloud for other solutions, and so they looked to Microsoft's Azure solutions, Azure SSO, and also the Azure B2C solution to address some of those other needs. Uh, B2C, um, like Cirrus Identity, can allow for um, options for social identity to do the, the exact same solution, actually, allowing alumni to authenticate to student information to do things like request a transcript. Okay, so the third use case, this is a very different type of institution, small private liberal arts college, um, and they have very different needs. Um, Specifically, their needs are really about reducing operational risk. Um, so many of these schools either have a bunch of scripts that they run to manage account provisioning and deprovisioning, or they've developed some other custom solution, but they have a very difficult time hiring, training, and keeping sophisticated identity engineers. And so the risk that they face is how do we operate or how do we implement a new solution and not lose the uh, resources required to maintain these solutions. Um, so in this case, uh, the option that they went with is actually a higher education specific identity solution. Fisher, Inter uh, Fisher International offered a um, option to do a cloud architected identity governance. It's also an all-in-one package. And so because they don't have um, you know, thousands of applications to manage through single sign-on, because IT is centralized, uh, a more simple um, but still cloud-based uh, single sign-on federation MFA solution uh, met most of their needs. Okay, so those are the three use cases. Um, so what did we find out? What are our findings? So 
one of the use cases we didn't address, and yet it still makes up a, a lot of our clients, right, is that budgets, IT budgets, or specifically identity and access management budgets, um, really put them out of the market in terms of a lot of the uh, cloud-architected solutions. And the problem with that is many of, the, many of these schools, like the third use case, the private liberal arts college, would benefit from those cloud-architected solutions most, right? Mitigating that operational risk, uh, having less customized, easier to operate, and maintain solutions. Um, we're also finding that vendors, specifically the vendors that don't target higher education, um, there's a lot of difficulty mapping the vendor pricing model to the pricing budgets of higher education. And it's not just a, that's really expensive. It goes back again to this notion of alumni applicants. So if you take, for example, our second use case, um, 80,000 applicants that they provision every year. Um, their active user group is about 50,000, but they have another 300,000 alumni, right? So on a user object-based licensing model, where less than 10% of those objects are actively active daily or weekly users, standard uh, pricing models um, don't work. So some of, the, uh, some of the vendors just have a really difficult time, and it's not out of a desire even on the sales level. Sometimes the salespeople working with the institution can't get enough interest up the chain to make uh, you know, creative licensing agreements. Um, so in addition to that, though, there is a lot of movement in this space. And I'd say part of that movement is we've seen some of the vendors starting to pay more attention to higher education and understanding that their current uh, licensing and pricing models, and even though their sales organizations aren't really tapping into higher education or meeting them, uh, meeting their needs. Um, and there's also a lot of movement on the solution side. So if you're keeping up with, uh, you know, Gartner and Forrester on these things, a lot of the uh, companies that are offering on-premise only solutions today in the, in the identity governance space or they're in the access management and authentication space, they're both growing their solutions in terms of sophistication and scalability to be that full package. Um, even with the use case that we looked at at the tier one research university, uh, we had a similar client 12 months ago, and even the vendor was sort of like, we don't wanna touch this with cloud today. Um, whereas 12 months later, that same vendor is like, no, this will work perfectly for you, we'll make it work. So there's a, there is a lot of development and growth in that space. Um, I think that's all we have. My timer's off, so I'm not sure where we are on time. So, four minutes. Questions, comments, suggestions? Uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of the presentation, I saw uh, the name of uh, Kevin uh, listed at the uh, potential uh, vendors that will fit uh, the requirement that you listed for the, uh, for the three tires. And the, the, the name disappeared, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a conclusion for the recommended uh, solution that fit, you know, your three tires. Microsoft showed up, uh, you know, as a potential solution for uh, the uh, IDA. So c c can you share the reason why, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kevin, was excluded to uh, the result of, of the study? Is it uh, the uh, uh, hosting of the solution? Is it the functional scope of the solution that makes a difference between uh, uh, Kpoint? Uh, so, yeah, so uh, the criteria we use to include different vendors in, in this process, obviously we had to limit it because there was you know too many that were out there to look at. Uh, the ones that we included were directly related to uh, leaders identified in Gartner and Forrester. If they weren't a leader for that specific identity and access management space, we wouldn't have included them. So the other criteria we use to include specific vendors is players that are really big in higher, higher ed, right? So like Fisher International, they're never gonna make Gartner or Forrester, but they're big in higher education. They're going after very aggressively the higher education market. So uh, the, the reason that we did, you know, include Savvy and part of it, but not the other part, is because we were specifically identifying 
that part of their solution, right? They have multiple products. So does that answer your question? Yeah, and the other part was, and of course this is all changing, like even like I said, with regards to uh, the use case, the same vendor over a 12-month period, even their, arch their engineers were speaking differently about the capabilities. Um, the other thing that we used, uh, they are all just supposed to be samples. So we just sort of took uh, name recognition, Gartner and Forrester recognized. We also fo followed Gartner with regards to um, the level of maturity for, either, for the cloud architected solution portion. So if it's not infrastructure as a service, it's not managed service, it can't be, well, we do a little bit in the cloud, but the rest is so that we also were using following Gartner on, on all of that. And all of this is actually, will very soon be part of a white paper that shows all of the data in it. It was just hard to include too much in 20 minutes, but it's a great question. I was curious about some of the results that you were getting. Okay. I was curious about some of the results that you were getting with regards to the larger institution because when it was displayed up there, it seemed that you had a decision by that university or big institution for multiple products, but it sounded like there is some kind of central decision. And just back to the point that you were making, the central IT often doesn't have the political pull to be able to make the universities or the separate campuses yep. make such a decision. I w I'm a su sort of surprised that you didn't have more diversity because in our situation, we find that the IDA often could be very, could be different for each campus. Sometimes they share the experience with one campus and say that yep. that worked out well for them, so they'll use it. And then the central IT has yet a different solution. Yeah, so this particular use case, two things that address that. So first of all, even two years ago, they could have never, they were, the, the lack of IT governance structure would not have allowed them to make these decisions. Yep. So rapid change in a two year period, a new CIO two and a half years ago, a new CISO a year ago, right? So things have changed there. They are part of a larger university system, but each one of those universities runs its own, completely runs its own identity management solution. Um, and, and again, these were meant use cases, just as the samples um, that we presented were sort of highlight some of the key players. Um, these are three of many use cases, but they are actually use cases where we could actually have used repeatable customers to back them up. So it is a trend we've seen in the you know 18 to 20 schools we've worked with over the last 18 months. So, um, but you're right, across the, uh, the statewide system, it's, it's gonna vary for each campus. Any more questions? Okay, thank you gentlemen. Thank you.